out to this talk, um, or watching it from home, I guess. Um, I'm going to start with two basic preliminaries on Tomo files, so what Julia uses to keep track of installed packages and versions, and Jupyter Notebooks, kind of what they are as well as what they're intended to do, right? what problem they want to solve. And then we will get into the meat uh, of the talk. Okay, so first we'll start with Tomo files. So there's two of them on every Julia user's machine, or at least two. Um, the first one is called the project, and that is a list of all the packages that you've installed. So uh, this Tomo is super minimal. It's only got four packages, and it's got some optional metadata that, like, like a name of the environment and the author uh, that, that isn't required. Um, the second Tomo file is for machine use, and that's called the manifest. And that is a list of these guys, their dependencies, the dependencies of the dependencies, um, and so on, until we get a closed snapshot, you know, a complete set of packages, what, what's called a dependency graph, that can be used to reproduce basically my machine state exactly. You know, so you have something like this is one typical entry where you have a package name, what the dependencies are, you know, some stuff that we don't need to worry about, and then an exact version number. Um, so the idea is if I give the manifest file from my computer to somebody and I give them code that I ran using that manifest file, using these versions of packages, they should be able to get exactly the same output that I got when they run the code from that manifest. Uh, forgetting about randomness and operating system differences and, and stuff like that. Um, okay, next up is the Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter is, all, is two things. It's a file format, this so-called IPNB, and it's also this online environment, the so-called notebook server, that we use to run and edit these documents, right? So the document itself is super simple. It's just got some text, some math, and some code and output, right? Some... The key, though, is that the code is an executable environment inside of, the, uh, inside of the notebook server. So we can you know, make changes. We can kind of update things uh, live. So it's supposed to be an interactive kind of PDF update that you can use to share scientific work and programming work with collaborators on other machines. Under the hood, the notebook is super simple. It's just a collection, it's a JSON file that collects a bunch of these uh, cells, kind of what's written there and the input and the output, as well as a little bit of metadata about how the notebook should be run. So what the language is that it's in, so it's Julia, and what version of Julia we were, were using, so 1.4.2. And if you were only using functionality from base Julia, this would be perfect, it would be all we need. The difficulty, though, is that what the notebook doesn't store is package version information, right? So if you're using outside packages to do things like make plots or do calculations, that information is not stored in the notebook and can lead to kind of fatal errors where things don't work. So for example, if I implement this math where I define two distributions and create two expectation operators for them and combine those to make like a joint operator, if I have on my machine the latest version of the expectations package that works, you know, that works fine. But if I type that into a notebook and I send it to my friend, it wouldn't work on her machine because the version of expectation she's using is too old. It's 1.2. And uh, okay, so how do we deal with this problem? The first way is super simple. It uses the package utils package that I maintain. And literally, you simply paste a manifest that you want to correspond to the notebook into the notebook. Right, so this is a list of all the packages and dependencies um, that are used, let's say, on my machine. And when somebody runs this, what happens is it creates a throwaway environment. Um, so, sorry, we also need to remember that we paste it with the manifest macro here that does this. Um, and it creates a throwaway environment for use in the notebook that kind of lives and dies uh, when the notebook server, this uh, local host server, lives and dies, right? And now when you run this, it gives you exactly the right, the right code. It doesn't give you this uh, method not found error because it's using all this, you know, alongside all this crazy stuff, the right version of expectations. Uh, the advantages here are twofold. The first one is that this is super simple. You just need to copy and paste something and then you know, that's all you need to do for your notebook to truly be kind of run anywhere. And the second thing is it doesn't interfere with what the user has on their machine, right? So the project file here is still this list of four small things and not this huge crazy thing. Uh, so you don't need to force your user to adapt to just your project, you know? Um, okay, the difficulty though is that A, this looks super annoying, you know, to 
have every notebook start with this, you know, this is much cleaner. And B, this is just a bit of pasted text that has no history. So you can imagine if kind of you email something to a colleague and they email it back to you and then you email it again, it's hard to keep track of how the state of things evolves over time. So this is why we have the instantiate from URL package that we use with, um, with GitHub. Package that has kind of two main use cases. Uh, the first one is to keep track of version information that is evolving over time. Right, so you can see here that you know we numbered this version with the bad expectations uh, 0.1 of this JuliaCon demo. And um, I've created a version 0.2 on the internet that has the right expectations. So this kind of evolving version is uh, something that Instantiate from URL does really well. In the quant econ lectures, uh, we have a bunch of different versions. Um, you know, and, and being able to just switch between them and kind of keep track of which ones I have and which ones I need um, is super powerful, right? So for example, when I run this, um, it tells me, you know, or it's going to tell me that, I, yeah, I have version 0.1 activated, but I've requested 0.2. So this is a warning if I need it. Uh, the other thing is to make package operations simple for new users, right? So if you look at the quant econ um, lectures, Right, we've embedded a bit of code into all of them describing instantiate from URL. Um, and this is because a lot of these students have never seen packages before. They also haven't seen, you know, they don't necessarily know what environments are. They're using, some of them are on Jupyter Hubs on the cloud, some of them are on their local machine. So we've tried to give them almost a little proxy package manager. Um, so this will activate the right thing for them, the right environment. And we've made a few opinionated choices here, kind of like uh, NB Git Puller does, if you've seen that. Um, so, you know, if they want to overwrite what's on their machine, they can use force. So this is useful if they take the environment that we give them, let's say in here, and they use those packages as a starting point, they upgrade things, add things, make a bunch of changes, but they want to revert to the kind of official lecture version. And we also separate instantiation and pre-compilation, because let's say you're running this in the cloud, you know, uh, cloud resources are super limited and, you know, you might not want to pre-compile everything if you just want to run a super simple lecture. Um, so that's why we've we've made a few choices like that and in instantiate from URL. But the, uh, the basic use case is super simple. Um, so what we can do, so this is still not going to work because it hasn't, it's chosen to use what we have uh, here, we can say domestically. But if we force an overwrite, it'll replace these bad versions with the appropriate ones and then it will, uh, you know, load them and, and um, run the correct code. Okay, uh, that's the talk. Thank you very much.